So let me give you a brief, brief bio of Chuck. He was born on January 27, 1924, on a farm in Minnesota. A few months after his 17th birthday, Chuck voluntarily enlisted in the Navy. He completed boot camp in Lake Michigan, then went on to San Diego for further assignment, and then he boarded the USS Lexington to go to Hawaii. In October of 1941, he reported to the Aerial Control Squadron BP-23, located on Ford Island in the center of Pearl Harbor for duty. And I will let Chuck take it from there. While he's working on that, can you hear me with this? Yes. We don't want to waste our time here. Uh, first, I'd like to make some comments to the Boy Scouts and to the Scout leaders that are here tonight. When I reported to that training center at the Great Lakes, Illinois, uh, and they mustered us out there on the parade grounds on April 4th of 1941, this salty old chief petty officer came out there in his dress blues he had enough hash marks that ran from his, from his wrist all the way up to his elbow, and he was wearing a ceremonial sword that almost dragged on the ground. Very impressive. He got our attention right quick. One of the first questions he asked was, are there any Boy Scouts here? Then he asked, are there any Eagle Scouts? And three or four of the guys raised their hand, uh, so he said, all of you Eagle Scouts, front and center. So boy, they trucked up there and lined up in front of him. He told them about face, so they kind of clumsily turned around. We hadn't had much training yet. And he told the rest of us, he said, look very carefully at these young men, because from now on, they are my company, assistant company commanders. And he said, anything they tell you to do, you do it, because it'll be just like it's coming from me. So work on your Eagle Scouts, because believe you me, it will be a great help to you all through your life. Another thing I'd like to say, that behind every Eagle Scout, every Scout that earns his Eagle, there are usually a set of parents that deserve a double Eagle, because none of these Scouts can do that alone. Anyway, uh, if I might, to refresh your memory just a little bit, it was 73 years ago. Is this thing here working? I don't, this one working? Not yes, sir. No, I don't think so. It was 73 years ago, this past December 7, at approximately 7.51 a.m. Hawaiian time, that aerial bombs, torpedoes, and machine gun bullets began raining down on those of us on the ship's military installation and even on some of the civilian population on the island of Oahu, territory of Hawaii. It was 73 years ago that the once roaring, blazing guns aboard the mighty battleships Utah, Oklahoma, and Arizona fell forever silent as those great ships, with many of their brave and valiant crew members still manning their battle and duty stations, slipped beneath the oil-covered burning waters of Pearl Harbor. In the many days and years that have since passed, I have oft times wondered, as I do most every morning, and as I would ask each of you to take a moment to wonder with me now, have those brave and valiant crew members on each and every day that have since passed, did they this morning, and will they forever stand muster, still manning their battle and duty stations there, beneath the calm and peaceful waters of a harbor they gave their lives to defend. The reason I say that is back in the old Navy that I was in, if a vessel and its crew members went missing, unless located and recovered, that vessel and those crew members were considered to be on an eternal patrol. Well, we know where the U.S. Arizona and the USS Utah are, so we can't consider them to be on an eternal patrol.
But I'd like to suggest to you that if in remembering them, it will help us to remember and keep the Pearl Harbor survivors' motto, which is remember Pearl Harbor, keep America alert. If in remembering them, it will help us to remember and do that. Then I'd like to suggest to you that though they have not been on an eternal patrol, they have been, are now, and will forever be on an eternal watch. The calm and quiet of that long, long ago Sunday morning on a peaceful Pacific Island paradise was first interrupted by the faint, faraway drone of enemy aircraft engine, then totally, completely, and forever unforgettably shattered by the roar of exploding bombs, torpedoes, shipboard, ammunition magazines, by the cannon's roar, the machine gun's rattle, the cries of the wounded, and the sighs of the dying. I have came to feel that no one who stood as they did that day at Pearl Harbor or any other military installation or vessel under attack, under attack, on or at the island of Oahu on December 7th, 1941, a date that has lived in infamy, should ever be considered less than a patriot. Those of us of the Navy, Marine Corps, Army, Army Air Corps, Coast Guard were caught off guard and badly, badly beaten that morning. But those of us who survived picked ourselves up, dusted off our pride, tended to our wounded, and buried our dead. Then set out to recover and repair those ships, aircraft, artillery, vehicles, whatever all else could be recovered and repaired. And in the ensuing months and years, with almost 100% support here on the home front, especially here in California, we began to receive an almost unending supply of new ships, aircraft, artillery, vehicles, ammunition, freshly trained troops, and whatever all else we stood in need of. With these things at hand, those of us of the combined military forces of the United States and a few of its allies set out upon, over, and under the waters of the vast Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, other areas of navigable water, flyable airspace, and approachable land, not only to seek out, but to destroy those who would destroy us. It took a considerable length of time and had a great loss of men and equipment, and we did not win every battle. But we somehow won that war. And I can tell you with an assurity that if the United States had not won that war, there would most likely be full fewer of you citizens, and surely none of us survivors around to talk about it today. I. Uh, and felt that I was very, very fortunate in that I was in the duty section assigned the 0800 to 1200 security watch at Aerial Patrol Squadron BP 23's hangar, Building 54, located on the harbor inlet end of Fort Island Naval Air Station on the morning of December 7, 1941. Fort Island is right in the center of Pearl Harbor. Anyway, I had arrived at the hangar early. I was in an upper level office attempting to type a letter to my dear sweet mother. I think prior to joining the Navy, I don't think I'd even seen a typewriter, much less had a chance to try to use one. But I was using that Ahuant Peck system, if you know what I mean. And uh, I think back then, if you could do about 40 words a minute, you were considered an expert typist. It was maybe taking me about four minutes to do a word. But anyway, I was progressing. I was making headway, and I was real proud of what I was doing because I was really going to impress my family back there on the farm with that typewritten letter. I heard the sound of approaching aircraft in the background, but that's not unusual. Where are naval air station airplanes come and go, but not usually that early on a Sunday morning. Uh, the sound of that airplane grew louder and louder, and I'm thinking, oh, well, a couple of the aircraft carriers had left the harbor the previous week to deliver short-range aircraft to our forces on Midway and Wake Island, <laughs> and uh, I thought they must be returning as usual. They will launch their aircraft while they're still out at sea, so they have the advantage of that carrier heading into the wind to help those old propeller-driven aircraft get off the deck of the carrier. They didn't, weren't using catapults at that time. Suddenly, the sound of that aircraft changed, 
and I knew immediately that it was in a power dive. And I'm thinking, oh, that's one of those air group pilots. He's gotten a little bit bored with that regulation uh, formation military flying, and he's wanting to do a little hot dogging. And I'm thinking, boy, oh boy, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes when the captain gets a hold of him because he's really going to be in trouble. Little did I realize that it was those of us there on the ground that were going to be in some serious trouble very, very shortly. Suddenly and almost simultaneously, there was a tremendous roar and bomb fragments, explosion debris, and window glass came crashing into the back of my head, ears, neck, and onto my shoulder. Uh, you gotta realize I'm 17 years old at the time. It, it kind of startles you. It takes a few seconds to get your train of thoughts back together. When I did, I'm still thinking it's one of our friendly air group pilots, hot dogging, hadn't pulled out of his dive in time, crashed. I'm gonna go down and see if I can be him some help. I pushed myself back from that debris covered desk and typewriter uh, and got up and started for the door. For some reason, I thought, boy, I should be in trouble up here using a typewriter. I'm not authorized to use a typewriter. So I reached back, grabbed that unfinished letter, ripped it out of the carriage of that typewriter, crumbled it in my hand, and threw it in the wastebasket as I went out the door. You can only imagine how many times I have wished that I would have kept that letter. When I got on the lower level, went out through the narrow opening left at the unclosed end of the big rolling steel hangar door, the sound of another aircraft. I looked up, and here comes this airplane in a steep power dive, and I'm seeing what's looking like blinking or flashing lights on the front, and I'm hearing strange popping, buzzing, and whizzing sounds all about me, but I don't recognize them for what they are. Later, I was told that what I was thought was blinking or flashing lights was actually machine gun muzzle flashes, and those popping, buzzing, and whizzing sounds that I was hearing were those machine gun bullets striking and ricocheting off that steel hangar door right behind me and off the concrete apron on which I was standing. But since I didn't recognize them for what they were, I didn't consider them any danger to me. My interest and my attention was drawn to a big old bomb hanging there on the bottom of the fuselage between the fixed landing area and that old bell dive bomber. Suddenly that bomb released, it wobbled as it began to fall, that airplane began to pull out of his dive. 